officers and dignitaries. These are amazing scenes. I'm told elsewhere in Kabul, elsewhere outside the presidential palace, uh, they are now flying the Taliban flag. This has happened so fast. As you say, I was in Afghanistan just eight days ago. I certainly wouldn't have left if I knew things were going to move this fast. And it is really quite amazing after uh, the whole 20-year investment of the West in Afghanistan. Just the US alone spent $144 billion. That's from a US government uh, report in Afghanistan. And for what? Uh, there'll be questions asked about the failures here. Forget about whether it was right or wrong to withdraw. No, no, no. How are you guys doing? Uh, it's amazing. Amazing week. Amazing last couple of days. You know, it's just uh, the images of Afghani Taliban is in, in, in the presidential palace. And uh, well, it's, a, it's almost a, a, a distant shadow of what took place uh, inside the U.S. Capitol in January 6, you know, uh, where the American Taliban uh, stormed the Capitol um, to install uh, their uh, uh, cult leader and started this uh, stop the seal uh, uh, nonsense. Uh, uh, it's amazing resemblance of uh, of those two Talibans and. And uh, now the American Taliban is, is screaming foul and how the Biden administration let Afghanistan fall and all that. And, uh, and then they all the talk about uh, they're going to put the jail, uh, the, the hijab and bail and, and, and women and uh, 20 years of destruction, billions of dollars uh, uh, wasted, uh, hundreds of thousand people killed. And uh, uh, they're talking about uh, uh, women dress and how the Taliban treat women and all of that. Where were the, all these American Taliban when we were bombing hospitals and schools and killing women in Afghanistan? Weaponizing feminism to expand our, uh, the empire, it's been happening before. We went to Afghanistan to liberate uh, Afghanis women and all that. Now, 20 years later, uh, we're doing the same thing. Uh, nobody uh, voted for the Afghani Taliban. You know, those people have uh, been fighting for four years. You know, they defeated the, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, the evil empire collapses right after that. And now they fought uh, the non so evil empire and uh, they defeated the, the american uh, now and the lesson of vietnam was lost as our guest today professor david Scholz, of political science at hamlin will be talking about uh, the article he wrote a few days even before the fall about the lesson uh, of vietnam that was f uh, 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 forgotten and professor david Scholz is uh, uh, professor of Political Science at Hamlin University. Um, um, he wrote an article in Counter Punch about uh, the lesson forgotten uh, uh, from Vietnam. And we can see the helicopter evacuating people from the American embassy in Saigon repeat itself in Kabul. Uh, we'll wait for uh, uh, David Schultz to we'll listen to uh, some music. <laughs> It's getting dark, too dark to see Feel like I'm knocking on heaven's door
how are you today? Very good. How are you? I am doing very well. So I was going to ask. I just did a, a little int intro, and uh, you know, uh, you know, the images of uh, Afghani Taliban uh, in, right. in the presidential palace. That br uh, brought my, uh, you know, uh, my memory to the images where the American Taliban were uh, in the capital uh, on January six. There is. I'm not. I'm not a fan of uh, Taliban, and uh, and I think the Taliban of this year, pro, you know, a little bit different than the Taliban 20 years ago. But uh, you wrote an article uh, even before, uh, uh, you know, two days before uh, the fall of Kabul, right? And you predicted uh, will be a same scenery uh, seen at the embassy with the helicopter evacuating who over is left, you know, personnel right. and dogs, but not the Afghanis who worked with us, that they were climbing, uh, taking off planes and falling off from the plane. It's just uh, uh, pathetic, tragic uh, images of what ha happened when an empire, uh, uh, you know, step into people's business and try to build the nation. We're asking question in your piece, why did we did not le learn from Vietnam? Why that lesson was forgotten? Well, I think there's sort of two answers here. One of them is I think it's just the the general arrogance of of humanity. You know, we just never seem Power. to remember. Yeah, we just never seem to remember um, um, lessons from history. Hegel's great line: the the only lesson of history we don't learn from history. But two, I think over the last fifty years there has been kind of this distortion of what the message of Vietnam was supposed to be. For people of my generation, you know, who intently watched Vietnam because, you know, we thought we were going to be sent off, you know, to Vietnam to fight and die, you know, I mean, you know, it, it was a very important thing for us to think about. And and the things that we learned from Vietnam, for example, uh, you can't you you can't bomb people into submission. You know, that that it's it was the phrase was what hearts and minds. You've got to win people over. Um, you can't come in and just sort of say we're going to conquer you, take you over um, and, and rebuild you in our image. Um, it was also about the fact that it became clear through the Pentagon Papers, you know, the famous papers that were released that talk about our involvement in Vietnam, that we really never had a game plan, like what was defined as victory, what was what was defined as an exit plan. So we had all of that out there, but it eventually got undermined. You know, 1970s United States, what was the phrase? We're in a malaise. You know, it's like the 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 empire, the superpower has been defeated. And you started to gradually see the rehabilitation of Vietnam. There's that famous line by President Reagan that says, well, we had to recognize it was a noble cause. Um, and so so I think some of it is collective amnesia. I think part of it is the arrogance of superpowers. Some of it is what? Just not learning from our own intelligence and, and, and deceiving ourselves into thinking uh, that it would be different this time. What I liked about what you argued Recently, you sort of posted something, and it's funny to watch everybody squabbling. Is it Biden's fault? Is it Trump's fault? Well, it was what? It was Democrats and Republicans' fault, George Bush's fault back in 2001. It was this kind of, I describe going into Afghanistan as like getting mad and slapping somebody. <laughs> or my friends used to work on cars, and if a bolt wouldn't come loose, they would take a hammer, hit the bolt, swear at it, and they would feel good for about two seconds, and then they did more damage. Uh, this was what we did in 9-11. We were mad. We were pissed off at the world about what happened on 9-11. So we, we just kind of basically, I don't know, reacted and, and never had a good idea. So the problem right from the start was we should have never been there. There should have been alternative mechanisms to address international terrorism. Mistake. I think the people who are running uh, the the military, running corporations, benefiting from those wars, no matter what. Yeah, we lost thousands, we lost billions of dollars, but the reason it's been repeated because it must be people out there that they benefiting from these disasters. 
Oh yeah, I was going to say we spent what's the estimate two trillion dollars um, in F, you know in Afghanistan. Uh, not to want to go back to Eisenhower's phrase military industrial complex, but I'm going to go back to it. Two trillion dollars supported a lot of Grumman, Northrop, Boeing. Um, uh, it supported the military industrial complex for 20 years, and also it became what an incredibly good diversion. And what I mean by diversion by that uh, is that think about again, we were after the collapse of the Soviet Union, 1991. There was this argument that we had invested trillions in the Cold War. There was talk of saying, okay, we won the Cold War. Where's the peace dividend? Are we now going to get this money to be spent on, on helping the poor, on health care, on social welfare programs? And 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 at first, I remember the elder George Bush said, well, peace is the dividend. Uh, there is no um, dividend. We're not going to divert the money. But 9-11 became the great diversion. Instead of now saying, well, gosh, we could spend this money on something socially productive, on helping people in this country and elsewhere, we now had what? A new war, basically a new Cold War. Um, and that basically sucks up our money, our resources, and our focus for the last 20 years. Because whenever anybody would challenge, let's say, the regime, would challenge and raise questions, it would be to say, we've got a war on terror we have to fight. Uh, why Bush is still out there? Why there is, you know, we, we put Trump on trial twice and impeach him twice. B millions of dollars was wasted. And he's still out there talking and saying nonsense. Why can't we put Bush on trial and his gangs, Rumsfeld and the guy with a twisted face? That's right. And we're going to continue to keep repeating it. And I want to stay with your point here because there were many people out there, let me say not many, but some people out there who made the argument that Cheney and Bush um, ought to be tried as war criminals, you know, for for what they did. And and. I, and, I, and I think there's a good argument to be made that they violated international law in terms of the actions that they took, not to mention the fact that in their deception, um, especially with, with Iraq, their deception about the weapons of mass destruction, um, that they ought to be held accountable for it. But I don't want to take Biden off the hook either, or Obama off the hook, because we know that um, Obama, as, as, as information is coming out now, knew about the fact that the war was failing, knew that it was not going anywhere and and tried what? Propping up, what was it called? The surges. We did surges mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. um, didn't want to end it. And then Trump um, 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 did did want to end it, but not for, I'd say, the reasons um, that, that should have been. He just wanted out because he didn't care about anybody in the world. But there's a phrase I used, I used to hear when I was growing up. You break it, you bought it. Um, we, we broke Afghanistan. We are scurrying out. Um, and in the scurrying out process, uh, we are, are probably now um, hurting our relationships with our allies because we did it unilaterally. And B, there's a good case to be argued that what? That the problems that are ensuing here also violate international law. Do, do you think the intelligence and the Pentagon and, uh, and, uh, and the military uh, kept Biden uh, in the dark? Yeah, it's yes and no. I mean, when I listen to Biden's statements in the last few days, what he seems to be also saying, unless you've heard something different, he says something like, we're surprised that it came as rapidly as it did. Uh, he's not saying surprised that the, the regime fell just as rapidly as it did. So I think there might have been a sense that everybody was saying to him, um, it's, you know, we're wasting resources. Um, the empire um, no longer, our Afghanistan no longer makes sense to the empire get out. But but I think they were hoping, and this is the Vietnam um, parallel. When Nixon got out of Vietnam, he said, my secret plan for ending the war was what? Vietnamization. He was gonna turn the fighting over to the South Vietnamese. And what he was smart about doing at that point is that it took a couple of years, you know, that the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese had enough resources and could hang on for a while. So it looked like they lost the war, not we. Here, I think they were hoping for the same thing. We would pull out, 
the Afghani troops would fight for a while um, and, and then they would lose and we could blame it on them. And listen to Biden. What he keeps saying now is, listen, he says, uh, the troops didn't fight. The Afghanis fled away. He's blaming it on them, not on us, on on him. And so I think in part uh, he knew, but I think in part he was also misled by the establishment um, who thought we can get out of here long enough to then blame it on the Afghans. That there's an awful lot that we don't know at this point that 20 years from now or 10 years from now, something comes out. We're not going to call it what the Pentagon Papers. We're going to call it what, I don't know, um, the the Afghani Papers or something like <laughs> whatever it's going to be. And we're going to find out that there has been like years of negotiations of which it occasionally popped its head up, like when Trump a few years ago. Exactly. Yeah. But, but that we've been planning the exit plan for a while at this point. And now the question becomes, who becomes the next uh, superpower uh, that feels like it has to um, 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 get Police. involved in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, it, We've gone from what the British to the Soviets to the Americans. Yeah, exactly. So now the question is: behind door number three or four, <laughs> is it going to be the, is it going to be the Chinese or is it going to be the resurgent um, um, Turks? Oh, yeah, uh, it, it, it seems like uh, they're going to be a regional, not a superpower, uh, absolute superpower like Soviet right. Union or uh, American, but it's going to be a regional superpower. We did um, during the Cold War is that we took regional issues and made them into global problems. And maybe at the end of the day, the one of the lessons we should have learned is that what was happening in Afghanistan uh, was a regional issue uh, and not a global one. Now, of course, someone's going to come back and say, well, then, then what about the Al-Qaeda? What about the Taliban? Well, um, maybe when it got to the issues of, of terrorism and so forth affecting the United States, I still come back to what I said earlier, maybe going in and trying to bomb people into submission um, was not the right answer um, to to figure out what, what was that line 20 years ago? Why does everybody hate us? They couldn't yeah. figure it out. Well, probably because we're trying to what? Push our weight around and try to blow them up. Maybe there's a different solution. We mm -hmm. never elected the Afghani Taliban. Nobody ever elected the Afghani Taliban, but we elected our own American Taliban. And that's a tragedy. That is nope. a tragedy. It is a tragedy. And so maybe that's the story here is that, uh, as I said, you know, first time it's a tragedy. Second time it's a farce. Uh, let us hope we only commit one tragedy in terms of electing one Taliban and don't do a second one, which would then be the farce. No, but the first one was a farce electing a Taliban. <laughs> that was true. True. That was true. <laughs> And the second one will be good serious. Well, uh, Professor David Charles, Political Science, uh, Hamlin University, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have you. And uh, we, 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 we need to get out of this. I don't know what the COVID is coming back. And every time we think we're going to go out and enjoy outdoor and we meet for coffee, things happen again. Uh, how is your books coming? Are you done? I am just about done. I'm in the closing stages. And so hopefully in the next... You know, before the windows close or doors close, whatever metaphor it is for the next Delta wave, we can get together. Well, what the box about? Can you talk? You can talk a little bit, a couple of minutes here. Sure. One of them. Uh, um, let's see. One of them is about. It's 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 real lawyerly like. Um, it's about um, um, legal reasoning and legal precedent. That's the most boring of them. Um, um, a second one is all about the. Um, um, election law across the world, trying to understand something about elections and democracy across a range of countries around the world. So it's kind of a big, massive edited volume. And then I'm trying to think the third one um, is what I'm finishing up, up is on generational politics and how um, politics changes across generations. And wow. Uh, even though we've just spent the last like half hour talking about how we don't seem to learn anything over time, um, and that may be true, um, we do also know that different generations bring different images in their mind about politics. And at a future point, we should talk about this because I think for so much of the world, what's fascinating is in the next five to 10 years, we are going to see the exiting of what's 
we call the baby boom generation, or in other parts of the world, the generation that came up during the Soviet era, replaced by a whole new generation of people. Same thing in what the Arab world, um, a whole different group of people who look at the world differently. And what will that mean politically? So that should be the subject of a future show. Wonderful. That is a very fascinating. Good luck with your book. And uh, let me know when you're done and uh, looking forward to, to see it and read it. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, Professor Schultz, political science uh, at Hamlin University. We usually bring him after we see a complicated political uh, phenomenon to come and put some sense uh, into it. Thank you so much. Good. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.